And landscape architecture involves the composition of landform water and plants with buildings and pavings to make good places. It can be compared with the work of artists who compose with cyan, magenta, yellow and black to make paintings, and with the work of architects who compose walls, roofs, windows, doors and floors to make good buildings. This video takes an overview of the types of project which dominate the history of landscape architecture. The focus of the art has been on gardens, parks and squares, sanctuaries and other places serving spiritual objectives, and the design of cities. New land uses developed in the 20th century, and landscape architects have worked on them, but the old compositional types retain their importance. I've traced their development in books, from which most of the illustrations in this video are drawn. The book's focus is on the history of art and of ideas, which is why their titles refer to garden design instead of landscape architecture. It's a more manageable subject. When our ancestors were hunter-gatherers, as they were for 96% of the time after Homo sapiens emerged, they developed an expert understanding of place. It remains at the core of landscape architecture both as an art and as a science. It is the skill which let humans and other animals find water, food, security and comfort in all sorts of weather conditions. Social cohesion was enhanced by the development of beliefs and rituals, particularly associated with burials and cremations, which took place at special places in the landscape. The oldest known temples were built 12,000 years ago on the highest hill in the part of southern Turkey where wheat was first cultivated. The place is now called Göbekli Tipe, which means pot belly hill in Turkish. Since then, the design of cities, gardens and places of the spirit has involved in step with other aspects of art, society and technology. Samuel Noah Kramer wrote that history begins at Sumer, meaning that the writing of history began at Sumer. This is also true of the history of landscape architecture, and the oldest literary record is from Uruk, in the country which is now Iraq. The Epic of Gilgamesh relates, in Andrew George's translation, that... He saw what was secret, discovered what was hidden. He brought back a tale of before the deluge. He came a far road, was weary, found peace, and set all his labours on a tablet of stone. He built the rampart of Uruk the sheepfold, of holy Iana, the sacred storehouse. Archaeologists believe that the Iana district in Iruk had the overlapping roles of sanctuary, palace and garden, as well as being the heart of a city. There's a poetic reference to pure Iana's fruitful garden, which may be a sexual metaphor, as well as being a complimentary remark on the temple's sacred grove. In addition to the palace-temple complex, Uruk is described as having one league city, one league palm gardens, one league lowlands. The palm gardens must have been on low lying ground so that they could be irrigated. The annual rainfall is about a hundred millimeters, and most of it's in the winter. Babylon was also a walled city with palaces and temples, and it is thought gardens between the old inner wall and Nebuchadnezzar's outer wall. A processional avenue led past the palace to the Ishtar Gate. The garden layout shown on the plan is hypothetical. Egyptian settlements, symbolised by the Newt symbol, 
were probably fortified residential compounds with a palace and gardens. Canals provided extra security. In Wasat, now called Luxor, the residential areas were on the east bank of the Nile, and the mortuary temples were on the west bank. Barges crossed the river, and processional routes ran through what became known as the Domain of Amun in the New Kingdom period. Mortuary temples were protected by high walls and accessible only to priests. Hatshepsut's temple is believed to have been designed by the queen and her high priest, Senenmut, who may also have been her lover. It can be seen as the oldest surviving great landscape design by a known designer. Senenmut has a tomb within the sanctuary, but he was buried elsewhere. The pyramids were burial places and, like mortuary temples, were sanctuaries. Avenues extended to the river, and the annual flood came near to the pyramids. India's old Hindu cities and gardens have all disappeared, because they were built with mud brick and timber. But archaeological remains have been found, and there are textual records. They were walled cities with courtyard gardens. Buddhism originated in India, and there is more archaeological evidence of Buddhist temples and sanctuaries than of their Hindu predecessors, because stone was used in their construction. The old cities of China were palace cities, also called king cities. Their planning is described in the Zhou Li and parallels the design of Hindu cities. High mud walls protected the emperor's extended family from his subjects and from his enemies. For feng shui reasons, deriving from Taoist beliefs, cities were oriented on a north-south axis, preferably with a river to the south and a hill to the north. In times of heavy rain, sand was piled against the gates for protection against the floods. Buddhism became a significant influence on China during the Six Dynasties, which followed the collapse of the Han, and Luo Yang became famous for its Buddhist gardens, symbolizing Nirvana and Mount Meru. The Forbidden City in Beijing is the largest and best surviving example of a Chinese king city. It occupies 72 hectares and may have had 10,000 residents, most of whom were soldiers, servants, administrators and concubines. Japanese cities, like Nara, were planned on the gridiron model of Chinese cities. Under the influence of Buddhism, which reached Japan from Korea and China, there was little difference between the design of monastic and aristocratic gardens. Building construction was light, because earthquakes are common. Security came from garden walls, so indoor space could flow into outdoor space. Buddhism became the world faith with the most influence on garden design and Japan is now the country with the most and best Buddhist-influenced gardens. Their layout symbolizes a cosmology which developed from Hindu beliefs. In Europe, the earliest cities were Greek, because it was the region nearest to West Asian cities. Typically, Greek cities were walled compounds on high ground or hilltops. They had pot plants in courtyards, but lacked the space and the water to make horticultural plots. Greece's productive gardens and pleasure gardens were on lower land outside city walls, where the soil was better and more water was available. Greek sanctuaries like Delphi and Olympia were even further from the main cities. 
They were enclosures within which the land is believed to have been managed as gardens. Sanctuaries were spiritual places where often warring peoples could meet for artistic and athletic competitions. Rome was founded in the first century BC as a village on the north side of the Mons Palatinus. This was the hill on which the emperor's palace was built at a later date, and from which our word palace derives. As in Greek cities, and as in Pompeii, dwellings were inside city walls and built to form courtyards. Gardening was possible in Italian garden courts because the cities had more rain and many were built on farmland, not dry stony hills. As the Romans acquired an empire, their cities grew larger and the surrounding country became safer. This created the opportunity to design palaces outside city walls. The most famous example is Hadrian's Villa. It was a government centre in a pleasure garden, where the emperor, who was gay, could have peace, enjoy the fresh air, and hunt in the Sabine Hills. Rome's colonial governors built comparable but smaller villa gardens throughout the empire. Fishbourne, on the south coast of England, was one of the largest, and there was a small governor's palace in London, now buried beneath Cannon Street Station. In the long dark age after the fall of the Roman Empire, Europe's countryside became dangerous. So medieval gardens were either built within city walls and castle walls, or they were attached to monasteries, which had the safety of sanctuaries. Most of the garden space was used to grow fruit, vegetables and beans. But the rich also made small garden rooms for women and children, minstrels and lovers. They were called herbers, but they were not herb gardens of the kind you see in recreations of medieval gardens. The relative order of the Renaissance period brought a return of prosperity and made the countryside safe enough for the design of villa gardens outside towns to resume. Florence was the outstanding city. The primary use of Renaissance gardens was still for growing fruit and vegetables. But more space was found for flowers and gardens came to be used to display sculpture and for outdoor feasts and masks. In the Baroque period, gardens became places of show, demonstrating the integrated power of church and state. Geometrical shapes and straight lines now described as formal reflected the sacred geometry of nature. Mathematical principles like perspective were drawn from Renaissance science. The geometry developed in gardens, notably by Pope Sixtus V, was applied to the layout of cities. This can be seen in the avenues of Rome, Paris, Washington DC, Moscow and a great many other places. In the 18th century, and particularly in England, the influence of science on gardens switched from rationalism to empiricism. Designers sought to represent the landscape of antiquity in their gardens. Artist representations of classical landscapes were seen as natural. But as the century progressed, designers became more and more interested in the world of nature as seen with their own eyes. So garden layouts became informal and irregular. The 19th century was a time when most parts of the world became acquainted with each other and interested in plants and design styles from each other's countries. East and West influenced each other. Designers, it seems, 
became more interested in using exotic styles than in producing work of the highest quality. Two good principles for dealing with the aesthetic confusion emerged towards the end of the 19th century. The first, drawn from the organization of landscape paintings, was the creation of a smooth transition from a beautiful foreground through a picturesque middle ground to a sublime background. The second, now associated with Gertrude Jekyll, was to base the detailed design of these three stages on the principles of art and the principles of craftsmanship. This influenced the detailing of garden cities and also the planning principle of creating a grand transition from the works of man to the works of nature, from beautiful cities through picturesque farmland to sublime natural parks. In the 20th century, the arts and crafts movement developed into the modern movement. This reflected a revolutionary demand for a new purity and for a new Puritanism, though detached from religious beliefs. Garden design was less effective than most types of design, but abstract art became a powerful influence, and an international modern style colonized the earth detached alike from cultures, climates, traditions, and the ancient principles of landscape architecture. Geoffrey Jellico, the founding president of the International Federation of Landscape Architects, was as drawn to modernism as he was to classicism. His work, even in the 20s, can therefore be seen as postmodern in the sense that had been advanced by Canon Bernard Iddings Bell in a 1926 book, Postmodernism and Other Essays. In the 21st century, postmodernism continues to flourish, in the sense advanced by Charles Jenks. But it hasn't made a useful contribution to the problem of how development projects should relate to existing landscapes which is the issue that led a Scotsman to devise the term landscape architecture in 1828. Landscape urbanism, employed as a post-postmodern, landscape-first approach to urban design, may be the best way forward, because the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you can see.